Hello, and thank you for joining us for tonight's USGS Public Lecture. My name is Mitch, and I will be your host and moderator today. We want to give a quick thank you for all of you who have joined us on these public lectures. We welcome you and are happy you've taken interest in USGS science. I have some quick announcements to make before I introduce our speaker. Next month, the public lecture will be taking a break, so there will be no December lecture. But join us on January 26, 2023, for Charles W. Manderville talking about building a national volcano early warning system for the future. If you are watching this from a desktop computer and need to turn on closed captioning, please look to the bottom right hand corner of the screen for the closed caption icon. It's the one with the two little C's. You can also use stream text for captioning. Please see the stream text link provided in the question and answer window. To access the question and answer panel, you can click on the question mark icon in the upper right hand corner of your screen. At the end of the lecture, we will have a Q&A session, and this is the panel where you can submit questions to our speaker. And now it's time to introduce you to our speaker. Joining us tonight is John Mola. John received his PhD in ecology from UC Davis in 2019. John was a USGS Mendenhall Postdoctoral Fellow at the USGS Fort Collins Science Center from 2019 to 2022. In October, he took a position as assistant professor at Colorado State University in the Forest and Rangeland Stewardship Department. His research focuses on a variety of questions within applied ecology and conservation, often with a focus on pollinators and especially on bumblebees. He is interested in plant insect interactions, fire ecology, and the use of conservation genetic methods to solve problems. So, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to John. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to be speaking with you tonight. Uh, if I could just get a thumbs up from Mitch or Amelia that the slides are up. Uh, well, uh, thank you again for having me, and I'm really quite excited to talk with you all. Um, as Mitch indicated, uh, I recently changed from working for the USGS, uh, starting as an assistant professor at Colorado State University. Um, so I'm excited to give kind of a, a, a final talk to the USGS, um, and hopefully uh, you all will find this interesting and informative. Uh, so we'll talk about Endangered Bumblebees, Science on the Threats and Recovery. Uh, that is the title tonight. Um, and so we'll, we'll go through kind of uh, my thoughts on some insect conservation more broadly, a little bit of background information that I think might be useful for folks to follow along with the rest of the talk uh, about kind of bees and bumblebees. Um, and then we'll go through a couple specific projects that I worked on while at USGS and then wrap up, uh, you know, hopefully with some um, actionable items for folks. Um, yeah. So broadly speaking, I think it's it's worth um, considering kind of insect conservation as this general idea for a moment. Um, and perhaps you're aware of uh, reports of declining insect biomass. Uh, so there are there are various studies like this figure at the right here which show some broad declines in the biomass of insects. Uh, and this, these sorts of studies have received popular media attention being referred to as things like the insect to get in or the insect apocalypse. Um, and presumably this, you know, is some future scenario where every time honeybees encounter each other in space, they explode. Uh, and, and this is, you know, a very dire scenario for the world. Um, and I think probably the most alarming thing about insect declines is how much we still don't really know about a lot of insects, even those that, that are pretty well studied. And I think this has to do with inertia, basically. Uh, there is a precedent in conservation and in research uh, that we don't really focus on insects as the target 
of our uh, conservation or uh, ecological research to some extent. And to kind of demonstrate this point, uh, there are over five, uh, five million species of insect in the world uh, compared to just the paltry numbers of mammal, birds and fish that exist. Uh, the amount of insects in the world is staggering. Uh, but at the same time, the numbers of insects that are listed under the Endangered Species Act is only about 6% of the animals under the Endangered Species Act are uh, insect species. And this isn't necessarily because uh, insects are highly robust to problems like uh, climate change or habitat fragmentation or, or habitat loss. Uh, it's, it's instead because there is a, a lack of focus on documenting insects. Um, there is a lack of expertise on generating this kind of knowledge. And so this is perhaps the most favorable photo I can find of Richard Nixon. And I, I believe I'm allowed to say stuff like that now that I don't officially work for USGS. Um, but this is uh, Nixon signing the Endangered Species Act. Uh, there's various start dates for the Endangered Species Act. Uh, but basically the late 60s, the Endangered Species Act uh, come, comes into our world. Uh, but it takes nearly 10 years before the first insect species is listed under the ESA. So that's 10 years of precedent, uh, funding for science, um, and basically 10 years of, uh, you know, regulatory grist build up before the first insect species is even listed. If we fast forward 30 years, by the late 90s, only 3% of the animals listed under the Endangered Species Act are insects. Um, and if we fast forward yet again, in the early 2000s, uh, there are some excellent studies documenting the decline of bumblebee species across Europe. And then in the early 2010s, there's some very important research on uh, bumblebee declines within North America. And this kind of really raises the alarm uh, of the loss of these important species. But it's not until 2017 that the first bumblebee species is listed under the Endangered Species Act in the United States. And with that comes the regulatory need, uh, the public interest and the funding in order to do the kinds of research that is needed uh, on these organisms to hopefully reverse their declines. So there's nearly 50 years of precedent before we start considering how to fold these types of animals, these important pollinators into a system that largely has not considered these types of organisms. Last year, the Franklin's bumblebee became the second bumblebee species listed under the Endangered Species Act. And there are several more species that are proposed for listing. Uh, so right now, this is a really interesting time to be studying bumblebees and other pollinators uh, because it's a really rapidly changing time. Uh, but, you know, so that, that, that sort of hopefully paints a little bit of a picture of one kind of perspective uh, that I like to take when thinking about this work. Um, you know, like people have asked me questions in the past, like uh, how many bumblebee queens are left in the wild? And, you know, if we're, if we're studying something like wolves, it's maybe very reasonable to know exactly how many wolves are left in the wild. Uh, but with bumblebees, that's a very difficult question to answer, but because there still could be hundreds of thousands, uh, but that doesn't make them any less endangered just because of the way that insects work. Um, so hopefully that's that's not too much perspective before the basic biology, but now we'll get into some basic biology, folks. Uh, so as indicated, my expertise really is bees. Uh, there is a stunning diversity of bees. There are over 20,000 species of bee uh, in the world, um, and they, they come in a variety of shapes, colors, sizes, different ways of going about their lives. Uh, and if you want to see more interesting photos of bees, the USGS actually has a fantastic um, photo album of bees um, in, the, in these really uh, interesting poses sometimes that you can look up. Uh, but I, I think it's worth pointing out, just because I get asked this a lot, uh, that most bees are not like honeybees. So when we think of bees, I think typically we, we think of the honeybee as sort of the default bee, uh, but the honeybee is anything but the default bee. Uh, so most bee species, like almost all bee species, uh, do not store honey. They do not live in large colonies. The vast majority are, are solitary. 
and uh, only a few of them are domesticated. Um, so honeybees are really, really kind of strange, actually. Additionally, uh, honeybees are not native to North America. Uh, so there's, there's all sorts of conservation issues around honeybees themselves. So while they're incredibly important for our agriculture uh, and, and very handy because we can put them in little boxes and move those boxes around to where we need them, there are serious conservation concerns around honeybees, but those concerns are about the impacts of honeybees and diseases that they may spread or the competition uh, that they may place on other wild bee species. Uh, whereas concerns about declines in honeybees are more of an agricultural management issue. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out because they get asked this quite a lot. Uh, honeybees are one of the, the few species that have barb stingers. And so this is a really amazing photo uh, by Kathy Keatley Garvey from UC Davis, which actually shows a barb stinger of a honeybee being ripped out of her abdomen. The vast majority of bee species do not have barb stingers. Uh, and so this would not happen. It's a fun little quirk of them. All right, so then, you know, like, if, if I keep saying the vast majority of bees are not honeybees, then what are bees? Bees are holometabolous insects. And what that means is that they undergo a complete metamorphosis. Uh, and this clearly is not a bee over here on the left, um, but I, I figure it's illustrative of what most people think of um, when they think of a complete metamorphosis, this change from egg to larva to pupa to adult. And bees undergo this same metamorphosis it just happens a little bit more out of our vision. Bees are obligate consumers of pollen. So organisms might eat small amounts of pollen, uh, but bees are unique in that they require pollen to feed their young. Uh, and so that's why so many flowers are adapted to attract bees uh, and kind of preferentially attract bees. Uh, so bees consume pollen for their protein, and they consume nectar for their simple sugars, their carbohydrates. Uh, and this is just an example here of a, of a provision of pollen and a provision of pollen mixed with nectar uh, with an egg of a single bee laid on top of it. And this is for a solitary bee species uh, that builds partitions between its eggs using mud. If holometabolus is confusing and thinking about exactly what bees eat is confusing, you can just think that bees are basically vegetarian wasps. Uh, so bees are evolved from a common wasp-like ancestor. Uh, and so they, they have these forked hairs that help them collect uh, large amounts of pollen. And unlike wasps, which are omnivores, uh, bees are vegetarians, basically. They consume uh, pollen. Though insects are weird, uh, so it is worth pointing out that in those 20,000 or so species of bee, there are actually a couple that uh, do consume meat uh, referred to as vulture bees. But for the vast majority of the time, uh, bees are vegetarian wasps. Bees uh, mostly live alone. The vast majority of bee species are solitary, uh, so they'll live alone. Some, like bumblebees, which we'll talk more about, uh, form small colonies of maybe a few dozen or a couple hundred individuals. Um, and it's pretty rare that bees form large colonies. Uh, so honeybees and um, some species of stingless bee also form large colonies. And this is a very cool geometric pattern stingless bee colony here on the right. Uh, most bees live underground. So you might see a hole like this out in your yard, uh, and that's possibly a bee nest. Um, a lot of bees uh, form their nests within twigs. Um, and so you might you might want to leave like uh, lopped off stems of perennials in your garden as nesting habitat for small solitary bees. A lot of them will make their nests uh, or, or um, partitions in their nests using materials like leaves or mud. Uh, so sometimes you might see um, like an eastern redbud. It's pretty common to see uh, small half circles taken out of leaves, um, and and those are taken by leaf cutter bees. Uh, but, you know, bees will find ways to make nests in all sorts of crazy things. Um, this is a mason bee called Osmia bicornis uh, that actually specializes in making its nests in abandoned snail shells. There are other, uh, you know, and, and like this talk isn't about uh, pollination per se, but pollination is like the craziest thing on earth to me. Um, you know, it sometimes gets referred to as uh, 
a mutualism. I prefer the term reciprocal exploitation in which plants and uh, pollinators are in kind of a mutual adversarial relationship with each other. Um, and as a result, there are some quirky reasons that bees visit flowers as well. Uh, and, and one of them includes uh, these orchid bees, which these are males in this photo. And you can see these kind of enlarged hind legs that I'm highlighting with the, the laser pointer. Uh, and, and those are actually uh, uh, basically kind of spongy. And these male bees will go to different flowers where they will uh, collect oils and scents from flowers to, make, to basically make a perfume in their hind legs and use that to attract uh, mates. Um, and so that is, that is quite fascinating. Uh, some other weird reasons that bees will sometimes visit flowers is because they've been tricked. Uh, so this is a bumblebee orchid in, uh, in the UK. And this flower, believe it or not, looks convincingly enough like a female bee to some species of, of male bumblebees uh, that occasionally you will actually find sperm deposited in these flowers because the males will be so tricked by the flowers that they will visit the flower and attempt to mate with it. Uh, and in the process, uh, the, the orchid will deposit um, pollen onto those bees. All right, so th that's kind of like my whirlwind tour of the wacky world of bees. Uh, but now we're gonna talk a little bit more about my primary expertise, which is bumblebees. There are over 250 species of bumblebee worldwide. Uh, you may have seen this one lingering in the background earlier in the talk. Uh, and we have a, about 50 species of bumblebee here in North America. Um, there's kind of this weird thing in insects uh, taxonomy where species are always being lumped and split and turned into subspecies and things like that. So it's approximately 50 species in North America. Uh, bumblebee species diversity is highest within the mountainous regions of Asia, uh, but it's generally pretty high anywhere where there's mountains within temperate um, climates. So we have some pretty high bumblebee species diversity uh, in the Rocky Mountains, for example. And bumblebees are very important uh, for crop pollination as well as wildflower pollination. Uh, and the ways in which they're important to crop pollination is especially with uh, plants like tomatoes or peppers, especially in greenhouses, uh, because bumblebees can do this thing called buzz pollination or sonication. And that's basically where they detach their flight muscles and, uh, and vibrate them very rapidly, causing uh, flowers that have tube-shaped anthers, like peppers and tomatoes, uh, to eject that pollen. Uh, whereas some other bee species don't have that ability to buzz pollinate uh, and so cannot successfully get this pollen out. Um, and bumblebees are also beloved by scientists that study behavioral ecology uh, because you can teach them to do all sorts of things uh, in exchange for a sugary reward. Uh, and here is an example of some scientists in the UK teaching bumblebees how to play football. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's quite fascinating what you can teach them to do, and they are model organisms um, of behavioral ecology. The typical, typical bumblebee life cycle is worth uh, reviewing with y'all before the rest of the talk. Uh, and so we'll walk through it slowly. Uh, so in the early spring, bumblebee queens emerge as solitary individuals. And so what that means is unlike uh, honeybees, which split off from their colonies to form new colonies um, and, and bring with them a bunch of workers, bumblebees do not do that. Instead, bumblebee queens emerge early in the spring as solitary individuals, meaning that they don't have a worker cast with them uh, when they emerge early in the spring. Instead, they carry all the sperm and eggs that they will need uh, with in, inside of them when they emerge early in the spring. They mated the previous year. And so these queens fly around early in the spring. If you've ever seen like a really huge bumblebee earlier in the, early in the year, it's probably a queen bumblebee. Uh, and they forage for pollen and nectar and then find a place to nest. So they establish a nest typically within something like an abandoned rodent burrow or maybe in, in um, like a grass tussock or something like that. Uh, and there they'll, they'll make what's called bee bread. Uh, so basically a loaf of pollen and nectar. Uh, and then they will uh, begin to, they'll, they'll lay eggs in that. And then those eggs will begin to develop after incubating, just, just kind of like a chicken, a big flying fuzzy insect chicken. Uh, and then throughout the summer, the bumblebee colony uh, 
uh, workers emerge, and then those workers take on the foraging tasks for the colony. And the colony grows through successive cohorts, getting larger and larger, reaching a maximum size of a few hundred individuals. Late in the summer or early in the fall, uh, bumblebee colonies will then produce new males and queens. Uh, these new males and queens will hopefully fly out and mate with uh, males and queens from other colonies. Uh, and then at this point in the year, the new queen is the only one who survives. Uh, so the workers live a couple weeks each, and then the males, they live a few weeks at the end of the season, and then they perish. Uh, and so these, these new queens uh, seek overwintering sites, typically by burrowing the soft soil or duff or, or leaf litters, uh, and, then, and then the cycle begins anew. So uh, a couple key things I want you to know is that the growing season or foraging season for bumblebees is quite long, starting in early spring and ending in, in early fall. Uh, and then additionally, they have this life cycle where they go from solitary to social and then back to solitary again. And because of this long growing season, bumblebees can be really useful for kind of thinking about uh, how do we conserve pollinators more generally. Um, so if we imagine that each of these curves represents when uh, a, you know, a given plant blooms throughout a season, and then we overlay our bumblebee foraging year onto it. Bumblebees overlap with most of these uh, uh, flowers in the landscape. And then if we overlay a couple solitary bees over that, those solitary bees might only be out on the landscape for the flowering duration of a couple plants. Uh, and so basically, if we can provide the types of habitat and resources needed to support bumblebee populations, it's very likely that we're at least providing a good chunk of what those solitary species need. There might be other things that they require, uh, but this might get us most of the way there. There are substantial conservation concerns with bumblebees. That is why I'm talking to you today. Uh, and this map is, is rather uh, busy, but what I wanted to point out is that uh, I mentioned that bumblebee species diversity is highest within the mountainous regions of Asia. But despite that, we do not have IUCN um, or, or basically conservation assessments for any of those species. Uh, and so, you know, our knowledge on bumblebees is, is actually quite lacking, uh, which is miraculous compared when you, when you think about how much bumblebees have been studied compared to many other insects. But here in North America, uh, we, we do have a better grasp, at least kind of generally on what's happening with our bumblebees. Um, and of about the 50 or so species, one quarter of those species is considered threatened or endangered. Uh, so there are substantial conservation concerns around bumblebees in North America. And uh, as I indicated briefly earlier, there are two species of bumblebee currently listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee, named of course for its adorable little rusty patch on its bum here, uh, and Franklin's bumblebee or Bombus franklini. Uh, and we'll talk substantially more about the rusty patch bumblebee in a few minutes. But there are multiple other, uh, several other really bumblebee species that are proposed for listing in the United States, uh, including Bombus occidentalis or the Western bumblebee here, um, which I won't be talking about at length in this talk. Uh, but I do wanna point out that its range, uh, you know, I kind of made this simple schematic just for the sake of the presentation, um, but this Western bumblebee here used to be common all throughout much of the Western United States. Um, and so this species has, has declined substantially, much like many of these others. There are several threats to bumblebees. Um, one of the, the biggest threats uh, to bumblebees, or one of the most, basically the leading hypothesis for why uh, some particular species have declined is due to introduced uh, pathogens from managed bee species like honeybees and like other bumblebee species uh, that, are, that are managed. Um, but there are several other threats to bumblebees that are important. Um, and unfortunately, even these five aren't all of them. Um, but pesticides can be particularly problematic for bumblebees and other pollinators uh, because of their need to visit flowers uh, and the fact that pesticides are designed specifically to kill insects. Um, there are also substantial problems with habitat degradation, climate change, and habitat loss. Uh, 
There are several knowledge gaps uh, to our understanding of bumblebee populations and how to conserve them. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these because it's a lot. And even then, this is still just kind of a subsample. Um, but there are some interesting things about bumblebee population genetics. Uh, like, for instance, we're actually not aware of how inbred these populations of, of these threatened bumblebees are. Um, and as I kind of indicated earlier with the example of people asking me how many bumblebee queens are left in the wild, there are a, a variety of reasons that bumblebees are very complex to count. I mean, first of all, they can fly uh, tens of kilometers. They're very small. They're, it can be numerous even when rare, which is kind of paradoxical, I think, for people that uh, you know are not used to thinking about insect ecology. Um, and then additionally, like, should we count workers or should we count queens? Should we count colonies? What if we can't find the colonies? So there are very, a lot of complex reasons uh, for how difficult it is to count or monitor bumblebees. There are also substantial questions about how we restore or prioritize our efforts to conserve bumblebees. And specifically, I'm very interested in how we achieve win-win scenarios. Uh, so bumblebees are occurring out in landscapes like forests, uh, but there are forest conservation issues. So how do we merge those two goals uh, to find solutions, especially in a, uh, let's face it, funding starved environment for uh, uh, conserving our planet's resources. Um, and then additionally, there are several basic parameters or basic parts of bumblebee life history that are still poorly understood. We have poor understanding of, of what explains year to year variation in population sizes. Um, and additionally, we know comparatively very little about queen bumblebees, um, possibly because they're less numerous than workers, but that doesn't mean that they're any less important. So today we'll, we'll, we'll kind of dig in a little bit on uh, population genetics, as well as uh, some of these other questions around uh, restoration priorities. So some select projects, and like I indicated, these are gonna focus on the rusty patch bumblebee or Bombus affinis. I um, mean, this is the first federally listed bumblebee species in the United States. So there's a ton of interest around its conservation. This species was historically common all throughout the Northeastern United States. Uh, so these areas highlighted in, in, uh, in gray here, these counties, um, as well as parts of Southern Canada. Uh, and this species was pretty common throughout that range as well. You certainly would have never celebrated finding one, for example. Um, though you should celebrate every bee you see, really, so you should have celebrated it anyway. Um, but now the species occurs uh, predominantly within these uh, yellow and red dots uh, here in the upper Midwest, as well as a small population uh, within the Appalachians. And uh, the first project I'm going to share with you is kind of ongoing, so it's a little bit of a taste of a project, if you will, and these results are very preliminary. Um, but there, there's substantial need to understand the, uh, the, the genetics of these populations um, in, or, in order to inform management activities. So for example, the Fish and Wildlife Service is considering doing captive rearing of bumblebee or, uh, rusty patch bumblebee to reintroduce populations. Uh, but we, we need to know some things about the genetics of these bees in order to be able to do that in a safe and effective manner. Additionally, we need to know about the population genetics in order to hopefully and optimistically inform uh, delisting decisions down the line. So to do this, uh, we have been collecting uh, rusty patch bumblebee genetic samples throughout the parking lots, woods, prairies, and roadsides of the upper Midwest. Um, and we don't have a very large team because we did this uh, during the, the height of the pandemic, basically. Uh, but we do have a very collaborative team. So we have also received uh, substantial numbers of genetic samples uh, from university, nonprofit, and state partners. Uh, so shout out to them. Um, and and I'm, I'm not going to talk about the broad scale population genetics right now, uh, but basically know that if, if you're really interested in this, that's coming down the line. Um, but I did want to point out that to, to sample uh, genetics of bumblebees, we take a small part of one of their mid legs. Um, and they actually fly away just fine and are reobserved for several days after uh, doing, doing this. But what I am going to talk about with genetics uh, today is kind of uh, looking at this case study, uh, an example from the Minnesota Zoo. Uh, and so at the Minnesota Zoo, they have pollinator plantings throughout their property. Uh, 
and they observe rusty patch bumblebee repeatedly year after year. So what can we learn uh, from the Minnesota Zoo in order to inform our management efforts? And one thing we might wonder is how many colonies of bumblebees uh, or rusty patch bumblebee are at the Minnesota Zoo? It's very hard to find the actual colony itself. Instead, we find individual bumblebees foraging on the flowers. Um, and, and so with that knowledge, we can ask, is the removal of queens uh, for captive rearing a, a feasible management option? So we can go out to the Minnesota Zoo and, and, and we got sent 18 females from the Minnesota Zoo. And like I said, uh, we know that we collected these individuals somewhere on the zoo, uh, but we didn't collect them from their colonies. So we don't know, you know, do these 18 individuals come from 18 different colonies? or do we collect 18 individuals from two or three colonies? So we can take that genetic material, and then with that, we can assign each of these individuals uh, to sibling groups. So in the same way that you can send in a genetic sample uh, to 23andMe and, and find out you know, who you're related to, uh, you can do that same sort of thing with bees. And so we do that, and what we find is from those 18 individuals, they belong to eight distinct colonies. So we caught six individuals from the blue colony, uh, five from the red and so on, and, and several individuals uh, where we, we didn't collect any of their siblings. Their siblings are out there somewhere, but we only collected these individuals. So 18, 18 individuals were sent to us, they come from eight colonies. So we can do some math with that, and that allows us to estimate that in all likelihood, there was probably 13 colonies that were active at the Minnesota Zoo in, in 2020, uh, with a range of eight to 22 being our, our kind of confidence level. So that means that if we were, were to remove even a single queen to start a captive reared colony, that would be like removing between four and 12% of the population. And so that means we would have to be so good at rearing queens, which we are not, unfortunately, uh, to make this a, a feasible option at this time. So instead, this kind of suggests that at the moment, we should focus on increasing these local populations before we start considering things like captive rearing and uh, reintroduction. All right, the next thing that I want to talk to you about in uh, my remaining time is um, this relationship between bumblebees and, and, and forests and the potential for, as I indicated earlier, these win-win scenarios between the needs of forest conservation and the needs of bumblebee conservation. Uh, and I'm a big fan of the expression that there are no spoilers in science. Um, so, you know, this is like actually the conclusion to the study I'm about to show you, but science isn't some mystery novel where we need to wonder whether or not the hypothesis was true until the end. Uh, instead, I'm, I'm telling you that uh, the next section concludes pretty strongly, I think, uh, that we really need to think about forests in our conservation efforts. And to some extent, we've kind of been overlooking their value in, in bumblebee conservation. And what I mean by that is when we think about what pollinator restoration should look like, um, if you do a Google image search for pollinator habitat, you get a pretty reflective picture of where uh, the research effort has gone where the restoration programs have focused, and that's in these midsummer flowering open habitats like grasslands and meadows. Now, these are, of course, very important habitats with their own set of conservation issues. Uh, but I think if we're interested in the conservation of bumblebees, we need to think beyond just this limited scope. And the reason for that is if we imagine this um, hypothetical flowering community again, and we overlay our bumblebee uh, life cycle onto that, and then on top of that, we overlay when grasslands and meadows in these open habitats typically flower. They typically flower uh, from maybe late spring to late summer or so, more, more or less, there's obviously variation. Um, but, but basically what we find is that in a lot of contexts, uh, these restorations in these open habitats do not have as many early season flowers as we might need. And they do not often have as many late season flowers as we might need. And so, you know, getting back to our rusty patch bumblebee, it was originally thought to decline due to a uh, introduced pathogen, but there is substantial interest in the roles of habitat loss and habitat fragmentation in, in uh, rusty patch bumblebee conservation. 
And we need to understand the role that these, uh, these factors have played in the decline of the species, as well as in the recovery of the species. So if we wanna recover rusty patch bumblebee, we need to know which habitats to prioritize, and we need to know what's going on in those habitats. How are the foods, the flowers that bumblebees use, uh, how are they changing over time? Um, and, and additionally, uh, if we're going to prioritize different habitats and prioritize different food plants, we wanna know uh, what's the relative importance of say forest versus grassland uh, early in the season or late in the season. So uh, we asked, you know, how has bumblebee food plant abundance or richness changed over the period of decline of the rusty patch bumblebee? Um, and because we can't go in a time machine and study that, you know, when we expect rusty patch to decline, instead, we thankfully have uh, a data set from the Illinois Natural History Survey. Now, Illinois Natural History Survey has been uh, conducting broad botanical surveys across the state of Illinois since 1997. Um, and, and this is a fantastic data set because it is in, it's in the core of the modern day rusty patch bumblebee population. Uh, and they have sites from grasslands, wetlands, and forests, uh, or data from grasslands, wetlands, and forests. Um, and they do broad botanical surveys across uh, their sites. So any plant they encounter, they, they document. Um, but we, we took that data and we filtered it down to two focal plant lists. So a list of plants uh, used by bumblebees generally, and a second list of plants that are thought to be preferred by the rusty patch bumblebee. And we used that data uh, to ask how has bumblebee food plant abundance changed over the past couple decades. Uh, and on the Y or vertical axis here, what you'll see is uh, relative mean cover. So basically, um, how, how many uh, food resources are there at a site uh, compared to the average site? And what we find is that there's about a four to 6% decline in bumblebee food plant availability within forests over the past couple decades. Uh, at the same time, there's actually been an increase in the availability of some types of foods for bumblebees within grasslands, perhaps due to our focus on and, and success of grassland restoration efforts. And there's been basically no change uh, in food resources within wetlands. And we see similar patterns for plant species richness. So the number of uh, bumblebee food species on the landscape. Basically what we're seeing to put it into picture form rather than chart form is we're seeing a decline in bumblebee food plant availability within forests. So that's, that's the loss of understory plants like spring ephemerals and we we're seeing an increase in food plant availability within grasslands. And this loss of uh, flowers for bumblebees within forests is likely due to things that have been studied in, in smaller scale, more targeted studies, uh, due to factors like overbrowsing by deer or invasive shrub encroachment within forests or things like changing forest demography uh, and increasingly crowded and closed canopies within forests. Um, but you know, like maybe this is a huge bummer for uh, spring ephemerals and spring ephemeral enthusiasts, but maybe if grassland resources are increasing and forest resources are decreasing, maybe for bumblebees, it doesn't really matter because they can just substitute uh, grassland foods for forest foods. Um, but as I've already indicated to you, when we look at the seasonal contribution of different habitats to bumblebees, that's, that's very likely not the case. Uh, so here again, you're going to see um, a fl you're going to see a curve basically uh, generated, and this this curve is uh, our expected flowering distribution of these different habitats. And what you'll see is that grasslands and wetlands do in fact provide more total resources to bumblebees, uh, but these foods aren't available until basically the middle of summer, whereas forests provide early flowering resources uh, within Illinois within our eastern uh, temperate deciduous forest, if you will. Now, the Illinois Natural History Survey, they're fantastic, but you know they, they haven't been surveying bumblebees for the past 20 years as well. Uh, so we, we overlaid museum records onto this plot. Uh, and, and you find that when you separate out the records by cast, that queen bumblebees are out on the landscape when these forests really are the main dining sources for bumblebees. Um, and, 
you know, like, again, this is this uh, problem of our perception and our effort versus what the data really tells us our um, focus should be on. And there are lots of images on websites like iNaturalist, which show uh, the use of these open flowering grasslands by bumblebees, um, by bumblebee workers, uh, because bumblebee workers are more numerous than queens. Um, but when we dig and look for pictures of what bumblebee queens or rusty patch bumblebee queens are up to, what we find is that they're predominantly using uh, these same flowering plant species that we find are in decline. And so it's really important to think about these foods that the queens are using and how we can um, uh, conserve these, these plants uh, because we know from lab studies of bumblebees that when a colony or a queen has a, a poor start to her nutrition when she's establishing her colony, they do not recover from it. So if a queen in the lab or a colony in the lab uh, is, is basically starved early on in their establishment, it doesn't matter how much you feed her later on, they never recover compared to colonies that had uh, good nutrition early in their life. Uh, so it, it could be that, you know, grassland and open habitat restoration is very important uh, for a variety of reasons, but it might not be enough uh, for our bumblebee populations. Uh, it, there might come a point where forest or early season resources have declined enough that it doesn't matter how much we improve late season resources, uh, it, it's not going to be enough. Uh, and so, you know, I, I really emphasize the role of forest restoration generally uh, to support these organisms that rely on them. So as, as I've been, uh, you know, explaining, this leads me to think, are we overlooking the importance of forest in bumblebee conservation? And lately, a lot of my work has been focused on kind of communicating this and uh, you know, prioritizing research and rethinking the bumblebee life cycle with the explicit view of forests in mind. Um, and, and I should say for, you know, any bumblebee enthusiasts out there, all this information was already there. We kind of already knew it, but now it's about putting it together in a cohesive package uh, that can really make it effective for our conservation goals. Um, so yeah, when, when we think about what pollinator restoration should look like, Yes, there is definitely a role for these midsummer flowering resources, but on these tail ends, we really want to be considering forests. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is thinking about producing these diverse uh, and abundant understory flowers in the springtime, considering even uh, overstory flowers and uh, you know basically trees that provide resources themselves. I recognize this is also not a bumblebee. Uh, and then trying to think about the role that things like uh, well-developed uh, duff and litter layers in forest understories may play in overwintering for bumblebees. Uh, and so to that end, uh, we have some ongoing studies looking at nutrition of different plants used by bumblebees in forest understories, uh, as well as the roles of, of forests in overwintering and nesting habitat for bumblebees. Uh, and one project uh, that I've worked on that I, I want to simultaneously shout out and undercut uh, because this project has kind of fallen a little bit defunct as I've transitioned jobs, uh, but we intend to pick it back up again next year, uh, is QueenQuest. So you can check out queenquest.org uh, where we're encouraging folks to look for bumblebee queens actively, uh, but also providing a repository for where people can tell us when they've um, incidentally bumped into a bumblebee queen. Sometimes when gardeners are pulling up perennials and things like that, uh, they will find a bumblebee queen. And um, we know so little about where they overwinter that even these scattered uh, records can be really valuable for our, our understanding. So going forward with bumblebee conservation in the U.S., you know, there's these two species that are listed, um, but we might be looking at a scenario where there's many more species that are listed. Uh, and, and there are emerging issues like the domestication of some other bumblebee species, um, as well as shifting agricultural practices and changes uh, in the quality of our forests. So there is a lot of science and research to be done. Um, but what I, what I want to end with briefly is, you know, answering this question that I often get, which is, what can we do to help? How can I help? Um, and I will tell you, and then I will tell you again, uh, the, the most important things to do or the most effective things to do uh, 
uh, or create habitat, support diversified agriculture, uh, participate in community science. So a lot of the research that I presented to you is, is really built on the observations of community scientists. Uh, and then also take direct action and be creative in your efforts. So uh, for, for kind of gardening for pollinators, I will say this is, um, you know, and I say this shamefully as the son of a landscaper, uh, but uh, gardening is not my expertise. Um, but uh, I, I will point you to some resources that hopefully can really help you. Um, but what I, what I really wanna shout out is that uh, continuity is key. So it does pollinators uh, not that much good if you have a ton of flowers that bloom all at once in one point in the year, and then uh, before and after that, you don't really have much going on. So instead, uh, especially early in the year, consider trees and shrubs to provide those early season resources and really try and focus on having a continuity of flowers throughout the year. Um, that's also more aesthetically pleasing, I think people would argue. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out that, uh, you know, not everyone has access to a garden. So, uh, you know, consider community, uh, community garden plots, or uh, I'll talk a little bit later about getting involved with um, school gardens. Uh, and, and you can go to xerces.org slash bring back the pollinators for much more information. Another important thing is, is leaving a little bit of mess. So uh, leaving pithy stems, brush piles, things like that uh, can be really important for bees and other insects uh, to, to overwinter. Uh, and really, I think very important to me is the consideration of the agriculture that we choose to support. So agriculture is the leading cause of uh, habitat conversion and habitat loss. Uh, so, you know, when we eat out of season, when we eat foods that are um, destructive to the environment or use lots of pesticides, those choices add up to affect the organisms that can survive. Uh, and, and especially eating out of season, um, I indicated earlier that some bumblebees are used for greenhouse uh, tomato and pepper pollination. And that occurs because we desire to eat these things radically out of season. Um, so, you know, I urge folks to support diversified local uh, agriculture um, and look up community supported agriculture, uh, especially if you're looking for an affordable way uh, to support this. And this is, a, this is a farm I used to work on and it was uh, quite gorgeous and quite full of bees. Uh, and, and very importantly, I think, you know, if, if you listen to this talk, uh, and I feel like I'm slightly over time, but if you're excited that I'm slightly over time, uh, then I encourage you to get involved with community science projects. Uh, so there's a ton of projects where you can find and identify bumblebees um, and support and, and submit your observations online. And that information really gets used by scientists and it's very important, uh, scientists like yourself as well. And then lastly, I encourage you to take direct action, get involved. So. Get involved with, um, you know, a school pollinator uh, garden project is very common. Uh, get in touch with your local parks department and request pollinator habitat. Anything you can do to address these threats to pollinators uh, is is going to help. Um, and you know, and I and I say get creative. Uh, as a side project of mine, I'm really into disc golf. Uh, so I've been working with disc golf companies and disc golf course managers. Uh, to get pollinator education and pollinator habitat into those courses. Think about whatever weird and creative and fun way you can uh, to do these things. Uh, and so with that, I want to thank a ridiculous amount of people. Uh, when you study endangered species, there are a lot of people involved um, and we couldn't do this work without them. And I will take any questions that you might have, uh, happy to chat. Okay, thank you, John. That was great. Um, my late um, entomologist father would have loved that talk. Um, remind everyone before we begin uh, the question and answer portion of the lecture, um, if you'd like to submit a question, you can go ahead and click on the question mark icon. Um, we have been monitoring questions so far, and I will go ahead and ask those out loud first. We will Great. do our very best to get to all your questions, but please be please be patient and understanding if we don't. Okay, John, first question. Very important question. What's your dog's name? <laughs> she is very restless right now, and her name is Cassie. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Been, we, enjoyed, we enjoyed your participation. Yeah, she's been sleeping all day while it snows here in Colorado and has decided now is the time to be active. Right. Okay, next question from Wendy. Yay, Minnesota Zoo. I work with them on Dakota Skippers. They will be awesome to help you with your bee, bee, bee breeding. Not a question, but a nice comment. Thank um, you, Wendy. Uh, another question is, I understand you're no longer with the USGS, but are you still working on this project? Yeah, so uh, my new lab um, will, well, uh, to some extent, exactly what we focus on is going to be, uh, you know, decided by the interest and creativity of the folks that come into the lab. Uh, but we'll still be working on rusty patch bumblebee conservation, uh, western bumblebee conservation, um, and uh, a variety of other projects related to bees, basically. Yep. Okay, next question is, how can I find out what types of flowers and plants to plant to help with this effort? Yeah, uh, so that Xerces, I think it was, uh, what is it, bring back, yes, xerces.org slash bring back the pollinators. Um, yeah. And on there, you'll be able to find uh, planting guides that are region specific, which is is really important. Yeah, I've, I've already gone, I went ahead and put a, put in their pollinator friendly native plant list into the Q&A session. Okay, another another one from Wendy. In general, could we use bumblebees as surrogates for many other pollinators, or at least for nectar pollen dependent species? Yeah, so uh, you know that gets to this idea of um, in in case folks are curious in conservation biology, there's there's this concept of umbrella species, and so that means you know a species whose needs can cover like an umbrella. Uh, the needs of other species. Um, and so, I, you know, I think by focusing on bumblebee conservation, uh, it, like it's it's still kind of debatable whether or not uh, bumblebees can cover the needs of, you know, all other bee species. Um, it's certainly going to be the case that they won't cover all the needs of all other bee species, um, but it might do a lot of good um, and, and be kind of a, yeah, a charismatic ambassador that allows us to really cover a lot of the needs of other pollinators. So, you know, the rusty patch bumblebee, I think in no small part has a lot of interest around it because like human nature leads us to kind of be interested in a species that's called like the rusty patch bumblebee. And it has this cute little rusty patch on its butt more so than honestly, some other bumblebee species that have, you know, like less charismatic names or, or looks to them, but have just as uh, urgent of conservation issues. Um, so I, I, I guess, uh, you know, I'm getting sidetracked there, but the, the point is I think bumblebee conservation can do a lot of good for other pollinators, maybe not everything, um, but quite a lot. Uh, and they're quite charismatic and, and uh, people can get jazzed about them pretty quickly. Uh, in a way that maybe they cannot for other uh, other equally important but less charismatic organisms. Okay, um, second part of that question, this is besides the underground and cavity nesters, are there any host plants that should be focused on for bumble for bee bumblebees? Um, besides for underground and cavity host plants? Um, not quite. So not it, it's not quite the same as, um, say, butterflies, where there are particular uh, plants that eggs need to be laid on for development. Um, so no, there aren't quite host plants in that same way. Um, but, uh, you know, like, I, I can't tell if y'all can still see this image on the screen or not. Yeah, so, you know, there are many plants that make these pithy stems. Um, and so those can be important uh, sources of nesting as well, but it's not it's not quite as um, specialized as as say for butterflies. Okay. Um, do carpenter bees compete with bumblebees? Um, yeah. So uh, carpenter bees likely compete with bumblebees. Uh, 
uh, for uh, food resources in some contexts. Um, carbon trees can be kind of complex to talk about because uh, they are native um, to the eastern. Well, there are different species that are native to different parts of the United States, um, but they are a range expanding species. Um, so yeah, you could argue that that is a new competitive pressure that uh, the species are not evolved to deal with. Um, but I'm not personally aware of any research looking at things like uh, disease spread by carpenter bees to, to bumblebees. Um, so when, when species like honeybees uh, compete with bumblebees, it can be detrimental because honeybee colonies can be so large and because they're managed, uh, you know, those honeybees, like if they get a disease, they'll receive treatment for their disease. Uh, so they kind of have this artificial competitive advantage by being managed by humans. Um, whereas other bee species, yeah, they might compete with bumblebees, but that the amount of pressure uh, is, is likely to be a lot lower. Okay, um, another question. Fuel management for com Batting wildfires in the West will result in a clearing of a lot of understory vegetation and forests. Are there best management practices public agencies managing larger areas can do to conserve bumblebee resources, e.g. this time, uh, time of year? Yeah, so um, that is actually, especially in regards to overwintering, that is uh, literally what I'm going to be studying uh, next year. Uh, so we're, I'm actively recruiting a master's student now to work on a project looking at how different fuels and, and forest uh, management treatments impact uh, overwintering habitat for insects. Um, generally though, uh, as you know, so how that affects nesting and overwintering habitat uh, is still, you know, an open question, very to be determined. Um, but generally, uh, fuels treatment and uh, and and burning typically has positive uh, impacts on bumblebee populations uh, and, and bee populations generally. Uh, so typically, you know, and and the question asker might be aware of this given the the nuance of their question. Um, but typically, when we do these fuels managements. Um, or we do prescribed burns or natural uh, fires burn, you know, that opens up the canopy, clears away a lot of the um, uh, maybe dense undergrowth um, and opens up uh, more light and nutrients to understory flowers. And then that has a positive impact uh, on, on bee species. Um, and actually to, to kind of besmirch bumblebees almost for a second here, uh, sometimes that positive impact might happen for bumblebees, but not happen for other bee species because bumblebees are so large bodied that even if they are killed by things like fire, they can often recolonize those habitats, uh, whereas smaller bodied bees might be killed by fire, uh, but unlikely to at least rapidly recolonize those habitats. Um, but that's also kind of a uh, ongoing area of research uh, where, you know, the answers are not very clear cut. Okay, um, let's see. Where were we here? Um, sorry. Um, if we don't do anything to help, how much longer will bumblebees be around? Yeah, so uh, that is, it's worth pointing out when, when being asked that question. Um, you know, I showed that pie chart earlier of about 50 bumblebee species and a quarter of them in, in the United States uh, are threatened or endangered. Um, so that other 75%, some of those species, not all, are stable or actually some of them are even increasing in abundance or uh, in range. Um, so bumblebees, you know, uh, like it's, it's tempting to think of them as uh, monolithic or homogenous or, you know, just very similar, um, but they have still nuance and variation within them. So some species are increasing, some are decreasing, um, but we're working on, or, or we just published, I suppose, uh, just had accepted for publication a, uh, uh, a bit of work on the Western bumblebee, uh, 
uh, which I did not talk about a lot in this talk, but um, is, is quite important, especially uh, given the time of this talk, I'm guessing more people are in the West, uh, but um, the Western bumblebee or Bombus occidentalis, it used to be quite common, was lost from a lot of its range. Um, and our projections, you know, 20, 30 years out are not very good for it. Uh, I can't recall the numbers off the top of my head, so I'm gonna leave it at vaguely, if we do nothing, that species is at risk for extinction in the next few decades. Okay, uh, another comment um, from Emma. My name is Emma, I am seven years old. I am scared of bees, but listening to you make me, made me less scared. Thank you. You're, you're welcome, Emma. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so is it another question? Is it so is it safe to assume that there are any bees that can be a pollinator for fruit trees and other garden products, yeah, not so, just honeybees? Yeah, so um, uh, there are hundreds of bee species. Sorry, Cassie, I, I, I bumped Cassie a little bit, moving my hands around. Um, yeah, there are hundreds of bee species that are important pollinators. Uh, for uh, fruit trees and, and other crops. Um, uh, I, I won't go too deep into that, hopefully, but uh, a couple of cool things that I'll point out is that uh, in the presence of other bee species, like the blue orchard bee, um, honeybees actually become more effective pollinators. So when you have, um, you know, just blue orchard bees in an, in an orchard, you get, you know, we'll say X, amount of pollination. When you have just honeybees, you get X amount of pollination. Um, but when you have blue orchard bees and honeybees, you don't get 2X pollination. You get even more than that because they change the behavior of how each other acts in the orchard and that results in more effective pollination. So not only do uh, other bee species contribute to pollination, uh, but the presence of multiple bee species can be more effective than each of those species individually. Uh, additionally, um, some bee species are just more effective pollinators than, than honeybees. Um, I forget the exact numbers, so I'm, I'm not gonna say them, um, but for uh, every orchard bee you have, you need something like 10 or 20 uh, times that number of honeybees to achieve the same level of pollination. It just so happens to be that we can put honeybees in very convenient colonies uh, or, or boxes, so we can achieve those numbers pretty quickly. Okay. Um, and, and there's like thousands of other bee species that are important for agriculture, but uh, there's, there's one at least. Yeah. Um, Susan's asking, where can I get info on best early foods for Western bumblebees? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for Western bumblebee specifically, I'm not sure. So I'm going to take a little note of that because I'm actually trying to think of good small projects for undergraduate students to do. Um, but you know, I, I would recommend looking on that uh, Xerces Society guide for your region. And you know, Western bumblebee to some extent is a uh, generalist. Um, you know, so it's not going to give you a sense of like its favorite foods. Uh, but might might give you some good ideas, at least to start with. And then maybe, Susan, you can submit your observations of Western Bumblebee and, and we will learn together. Okay. Um, from Robin, are there good, are, excuse me, are there bumblebees in the desert Southwest? Uh, yeah, so there are some bumblebee species in the desert Southwest. Um, uh, including uh, Bombus sonoris, which is, is now very uncommon. It, it's actually a subspecies of the American bumblebee. This gets into why, you know, I say approximately 50 species. Um, there are a few other bumblebee species in the desert Southwest. I can't um, think of them off the top of my head and I don't want to get it wrong. Um, but if you go to bumblebeeatlas.org, uh, they'll, have, they'll have all sorts of great information on there. Um, but the desert Southwest, while it, it actually doesn't have a ton of bumblebee species, um, but the desert Southwest has the, uh, among some of the highest bee species diversity in general. Uh, so bumblebees are kind of adapted to these uh, maybe higher elevation or cooler 
environments um, or wetter environments. Um, but bees in general, bee species richness in general is extremely high in, in arid regions. Uh, and that's because you have plants that bloom at these like really erratic uh, intervals and in response to small amounts of, of water. And so that, that kind of cultivates the conditions for uh, lots of different bee species to become adapted to that uh, heterogeneity. Okay, um, a non-bee question asks, what is disc golf? Ah, okay, uh, so di unfortunately I, I don't have the discs in here because I'm not in, my, uh, not in my usual office, but um, yeah, disc golf is, is basically just golf played with Frisbees instead of, uh, uh, you know, stick and ball. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to play lots of golf and then I got really into ultimate Frisbee. Uh, and then as an adult, I, I realized I could merge those two joys. And um, I, ha I have opinions about the environmental sustainability of, of traditional golf. Uh, so disc golf is kind of this like environmentally friendly form of golf. Okay. And you can, you um, can find Rusty Patch Bumblebee on disc golf courses uh, in, in the upper Midwest. There you go. Um, I rescued a bumblebee recently in the windstorm that was on my front doormat. I assumed it was a queen, queen that needed an overwinter site. I relocated it to a wood shed open to the outside for shelter from the wind. Was this a good place? It, it very well could be, um, especially if it, if she was still moving about. She may have found somewhere in the woodshed um, uh, to kind of crawl under a, a pile of wood or something like that. Uh, and so that that could be quite the successful spot. Um, yeah, we you know that is another thing that the lab will be working on is um, can bumblebees exit and re-enter uh, hibernation or, or torpor. Um, so there are some bat species, for example, that can uh, kind of wake up in response to fire, relocate where they're um, in their uh, hibernation type state, and then re-enter that hibernation type state in a safe place in response to, to moving um, from fire. Uh, and we don't know if, you know, can bumblebees uh, deal with like a disturbance uh, of, of varying sorts and then move to a new overwintering location. Okay, um, we're getting close to our time to be done here. Um, don't want to keep everybody too much longer. Um, I live from Michael. I live in Northern California. What is your theory for the rapid decline and probable extinction of Franklin's bumblebee? Forest yeah. decline associated? What, oh, sorry, what was that very last You said part? forest decline associated. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. So, if, you know, Franklin's bumblebee is this quite weird species where it was never all that common uh, to begin with and has a very small range. So it has the smallest range of any bumblebee, um, kind of restricted to just uh, very southern Oregon and northern California. So the Klamath and kind of Siskiyou mountain ranges. Um, and Robin Thorpe last observed uh, Bombus Franklin I or Franklin's Bumblebee, I believe in 2006. Um, if you type in the old man and the bee, uh, kind of like the old man and the sea, but old man and the bee, uh, there's a very nice CNN article about Robin Thorpe who, who passed away a few years ago, but was uh, an imminent bumblebee biologist. Um, and uh, Franklin's Bumblebee, in, in my kind of opinion, because we don't have enough data to really have like a, you know, uh, a, a, a good hypothesis, I guess. Uh, Franklin's bumblebee is in the same subgenus as Bombus occidentalis, the Western bumblebee, and in the same subgenus as the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, so that that kind of means that you know the key driver is more than likely that uh, that pathogen exposure. So there's there's something about that subgenus that makes it more susceptible to that pathogen than other subgenera of bumblebees. So Franklin's Rusty Patch and Western Bumblebee are very closely related. Okay. Um, I think if we have a few more questions that I don't think we're going to have time to get to. I wish to apologize to those folks who didn't, I didn't ask their questions. Um, 
But again, thank you, John, for a great lecture tonight. Yeah, um, thanks, y'all. This was really fun. I, I've had COVID for the past week, so this was a nice way to finally get to talk to some people, even if I can't see or hear you. <laughs> okay. Like again, thank you all for joining us again tonight. Um, this lecture will be available for on-demand viewing in about a week on our website at www.usgs.gov slash PLS. Um, you can also see many of our previous recordings on the website under the multimedia section for videos. If you would like to subscribe to be part of our monthly mailing list, feel free to send us an email at wmcesic at usgs.gov, and we will be happy to add you to the list. Remember, there will be no December lecture, but join us again on January 26th, 2023, for Charles Mandeville's talk on building a national, excuse me, a national volcano early warning system for the future. Hope to see you then. Have a happy holidays and goodbye.